Good morning, Shanghai. It's my great honor, distinct pleasure to address you all, the attendees of the World Artificial Intelligence Conference in Shanghai. The broad topic of this part of the conference is artificial general intelligence, directions and risks in the era of large language models. I have much to say on this. But first, let's look back to better understand where we are. The field of artificial intelligence is roughly 70 years old. In this century, it has undergone great changes. In particular, in the last decade, AI has become economically important and enormous amounts of new money has flowed into the development of AI products and research. In the last decade, the field has grown enormously. The number of people involved in AI research and development has increased by a factor of 10, or even a factor of 100 by some ways of counting. And then, most recently, with the release of OpenAI's ChatGTP less than a year ago, AI has exploded into the public consciousness. Uh, along with increasing excitement, there's also increasing fear of AI. There are calls for a pause or halt in AI de development. There are claims that AI poses an existential risk, a risk of extinction comparable to that of pandemics and nuclear war. I've always said people should not fear AI, but they should be paying attention. Today, I would sharpen this. I would say AI's biggest risk is fear. That is, we are entering a time of great change, which is now becoming apparent to many. We have critical decisions to make. We should not be making them out of fear, and then we risk making them poorly. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, first, let's look at the drivers of the fear. And the biggest driver of all is Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is the steady, continual, exponential fall in the cost of computer power. We've all seen graphs such as the one here, which has uh, the computer power per dollar on the y-axis in, in a logarithmic scale so that each major increment is actually an a increase in computer power of five orders of magnitude, 100,000 times. And on the x-axis, we have time, years. And we see uh, the, the curve is, is slightly curving upward, which means it's slightly faster than uh, a, a straight line would be an exponential in, increase. This is slightly faster than exponential, just slightly. Anyway, it's, it's a, it does seem to be a clear trend and we can plot it out. And if you, if you map it out farther into the future, eventually it will cross 10 to the 16th computer calculations per second for $1,000. And that's what is roughly estimated to be the power of the human brain. So, and so we, the, the line will cross um, 10 to the 16th in about 2030. Of course, so we'll have brain scale computer power for $1,000 by 2030. Of course, this is just the hardware, the algorithms, the software. We'll take a couple we may, may well take a couple of additional decades. They might come right away or they might take a bit longer. But once we have those two, then we should be able through technology to create or become beings of greater intelligence than hum current humans. And this will change things. This will be, might be best thought as the ascent of man, the ascent of humanity. And at that point, the succession to AI is inevitable. This would be the next great step. Technologically enhanced humans and then AIs would be our successors. Inevitably, eventually, they would become more important in all ways, in, or, in almost all ways, than ordinary humans. So the main argument in this talk is the argument for succession planning. Basically, Moore's, raw, Moore's law, reaching its critical stage, computation, reaching these critical levels, and everybody seeing the economic advantages of AI, the algorithms will be invented, and powerful AIs will be made. Inevitably, we will create our successors. 
It need not be viewed as bad in any way. We've known this was coming since the beginning of AI, at least since von Neumann and IJ Good. Many of us have viewed it as a thoroughly good event. Let me introduce you to one who saw it and embraced it early on, Hans Moravec. Hans Moravec is a respected roboticist, AI and computer vision researcher. Worked at, he studied at Stanford and worked at Carnegie Mellon University. He wrote two popular books about these trends, uh, one in 1988 and one in 1998. The first was titled Mind Children. The second was, was subtitled A Mere Machine to Transcendent Mind. So they, they, they embody this, this attitude. So I read these two books when they came out and I found them compelling. And I thought I would share with you uh, the key the key way Hans Morvik expressed it, which I find very well expressed. Okay, so these are the words of Hans Morvik on the ascent from man to AI. Barring, cat barring cataclysms, I consider the development of intelligent machines a near-term inevitability. Rather quickly, they would displace us from existence. I am not as alarmed as many, since I consider these future machines our progeny, mind children built in our likeness, ourselves in more potent form. They will embody humanity's best hope for a long-term future. And it behooves us to give them every advantage and to bow out when we can no longer contribute. I think that's a pretty powerful statement of the sort of humble attitude towards the succession of machines from man. Now he does add a, a final line that we can all appreciate, I think, which is that we can probably arrange for ourselves a comfortable retirement before we fade away. That's from a robot, from mere machine to transcendent mind, 1998. Okay, so coming back to the main argument, these first two steps, it's coming, it's inevitable, can be viewed as good. Uh, in any event, whether it's good or bad, we need to do succession planning and we need to do it soberly and we shouldn't, we can't really do that out of fear. We shouldn't do it out of fear. So I want to remind you of some great truths. Uh, this is that AI is not a new and alien technology. It's one of the oldest of human striving. It's, 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 it's to understand ourselves, improve our lives by creating tools, and then to be changed by our tools. For thousands of years, philosophers and ordinary people alike have wondered about and sought to understand human intelligence. Almost every great Western philosopher since Aristotle and Plato has devoted a major portion of the work to the philosophy of mind. If we look at the classic Western philosophers, um, much of their work was about the mind. John Locke wrote an essay concerning human understanding. Immanuel Kant wrote the critique of pure reason. And Rene Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am. All were, were contemplations and thinking about how they themselves worked and how their mind worked. But later, um, uh, scientists uh, and, uh, and others um, started to study, empirically study the nervous system and psychology. These became large fields. Fundamentally, people have always been fascinated by their own inner workings, both in a scientific way and in less scientific ways. It was Gustav Fechner and Herm Herman Ebenhaus and Ivan Pavlov and Edward Thorndike and B.F. Skinner and Edward Tolman. These are the great psychologists, the animal learning theories. But there were also people who thought differently like Jean P John Piaget, Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung and Timothy Leary even. All these people wondered how do our minds work and how can we make them work better? Um, So I think this is a grand challenge. And it's not just narcissism. 
uh, I think Kurzweil got it right when he said, intelligence is the most powerful phenomenon in the universe. Intelligence is powerful. It's, it's proper for us to seek to understand it, both in general and for, as part of understanding ourselves. So understanding intelligence, I think it's like the holy grail of both science and the humanities. It's a great and glorious scientific prize. Okay, so that's sort of the positive take. Now let's talk, let's contrast this view with the fearful view. And I think this, what we have here is somewhat noble and honorable, but I think the reasons for fearing AI are far less noble. So what are these reasons? Well, number one, I think it's just cynicism. The belief that evil wins and thus a super rational, intelligent AI will be evil. Um, yeah, there, there's a presumption that it will be evil rather than cooperative and, um, and, and useful, a useful companion and coworker to man. A second reason I would call a humanism, but humanism in the sense of being akin to racism, systematic bias against the eyes, denial of their moral worth and their first class personhood. These are also not noble thoughts, but they are certainly part of what, what's going on and part of what is, is, is in the argument for being fearful of AIs. Finally, there's just conservatism, fear of change, timidness, fear of the other tribe, or the AIs of the other tribe. So I don't think we should fear succession. I think we should not resist it. We should embrace it and prepare for it. Why, why would we want greater being, greater AIs, more intelligent beings kept subservient to us? Why don't we rejoice in their greatness as a symbol and extension of our greatness and work together towards a greater and more inclusive civilization? So how I conclude, we are in the midst of a major step in the evolution of the planet, if not the universe. Succession, the step is succession from ordinary humans to enhanced humans and then AIs. We need sober succession planning. The biggest risk to a successful succession is fear. Clamping down, trying to control everything. This is what people are calling for, but it's not the answer. We have to find a more humble place in the transformation on the succession. A successful succession offers economic abundance, scientific glory, and the best hope for a long-term future for humanity. What an adventure, what an exciting time to be alive. Thank you very much for your attention. At this point, I would normally stop and offer to take your questions. But of course, I can't do that today because I'm not really here. I would love to, to be there. I'd love to hear your questions. So feel free to email me, email your questions to me at rich at richsutton.com. And let me take this extra time to show you two more slides to tell you just a tiny bit what I am personally up to now in my research. So what I'm doing, what I'm up to, is basically what I call the Alberta Plan for AI Research. And this plan is a document. It's by myself and Michael Bowling and Patrick Polarski on archive. The Alberta Plan is a direct run at the grand scientific prize of understanding intelligence. It involves deep learning algorithms reworked, and that's, they're all reworked for continual learning and meta-learning. And it involves taking a, an entirely a learning approach, in particular model-based reinforcement learning, enhanced with, with the ability to, for the agents to pose subtasks for themselves. So the diagram suggests the basic structure of the agent. You see on the outside, um, there is the actions and the reward. And then uh, coming in from the environment is 
not a state, but an observation. Um, it's a little bit of sophistication to convert the observation and together with the stream of actions uh, recursively uh, back to produce the state. This process, processing the state in the action, produce the state we call perception. So the output of perception then passes to the policy. The policy picks the actions directly. These two are sufficient to be a whole agent. But if you want to learn, you better be able to use the reward and you better uh, learn a value function in order to do that. And this is, of course, one of the fundamentals of reinforcement learning. So the out coming out of the value function is a TD error, which causes learning. And I, I indicate that by an arrow that's crossing the policy and indicating that it changes the policy, but it isn't a direct input that's determining the immediate action. Now, there's also a green arrow coming down from the model, the transition model or model of the world. And that is represents planning, which also changes changes the policy. So in these two ways, we can improve the policy and become a better and better agent. And that's what makes it a model-based system. In fact, that it's using a model of the plan. Now, what, what the posing of subtasks, that's suggested by the fact that behind the policy and behind the value function is a whole bunch of policies and a whole bunch of value functions. Those are the solutions to the subtask. Yeah, so the agent can basically live its life and say, oh, I, what if I, this is an interesting thing that's occurred, an interesting element of the state vector. Why don't, could I cause that to occur again if I wanted to? Let me learn how to do that and uh, let the model learn about the consequences of doing that. And together we uh, can get a more uh, higher level abstractions in state and time. And that's the Alberta plan for AI research. The other thing I'm doing right now is I'm founding Open Mind Research. It's a new organization, a charitable research organization in order to execute the Alberta plan for AI research. The distributed uh, network of research fellows around the world, but centered in Alberta. And the purpose is to understand intelligence and share it with the world, explicitly to share it with the world. So our culture is one of open source and open science. All research product will be published in the open scientific literature and no intellectual property will be retained or any other retained equity. So, uh, I'm currently seeking donors to help create open mind research. So if you have any ideas about that, uh, please drop me a note at, again at rich at richsutton.com. Thank you again for your attention.